ask you a question. Have you ever received a prophetic word from the Lord? And that you know that it's a genuine prophetic word from God through one of the prophetic vessels. And almost immediately something opposite starts to happen in your life. Have you ever had that happen? Oh, you're going to have great financial breakthrough. And you get a letter from the IRS. God's going to bless your marriage. And then all of a sudden your husband hates your guts for no reason. Your children are going to fall in love with the Lord. And all of a sudden they're smoking weed. Have you ever had this happen to you? You know, this has happened to me so many times. Recently, I started thinking about this. Is it God giving me a prophetic word and the devil heard it at the same time so he's opposing it? And God is allowing it so that my faith will grow? Or is it God knowing what is coming so he gives me the prophetic word to encourage me to overcome what is coming? I don't know the answer, but I feel like it's kind of both. I don't know how God is so much greater than us. His wisdom is beyond what we can understand. But I am recently learning that sometimes God already knows what's coming, so he gives us the prophetic word. Because when it comes, then you remember his promise and you say, I'm going to be okay. It's going to be fine. Recently, I had a situation like that too. Like, you know, you guys know what we're going through with the city. And I received a very powerful word, uh, you know, from a well-known prophet that you're going to have a huge breakthrough with the city. And literally next day, I hear that uh, we have to install fire sprinklers for both floors now. <laughs> because uh, OCFA allows it, doesn't allow it for only one floor. So that's going to double our cost for the sprinklers. So initially, I was thinking about it. But if I had not received that prophetic word, I would have been discouraged, I think. But when I received that prophetic word, I'm like, okay, that's going to be nothing. The Lord is going to take care of it. It's only money, right? To God, one dollar, million dollars, it's all the same to him. Right? It's like Monopoly money. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? To him, it's not that hard to heal a headache or a cancer. To him, it's just all the same. It's not that difficult. Whether you're in need of a million dollars or ten dollars, he can handle it. He's much greater than that, you know. But then when discouragements come, sometimes we get tired, right? And different thoughts enter our mind. Have you ever had this thing come where, uh, well, let me give you an example. Uh, from 2008, we used to host so many conferences, so many. Uh, some years, as many as five conferences. We had all the well-known people come through our church from Heidi Baker to uh, Patricia King, James Gall. All these people used to come to our conferences, and it was really powerful. And our Jesus Generation Conference, which we put on at the end of the year, uh, started in 2008 and went straight for 14 years until 2021, every December. We brought the new year uh, uh, in together until midnight, last four or five days of the week. And uh, the, this one year, I was receiving all these prophetic words that this is going to be the year. This is going to be such a powerful conference. And Jesus' generation conference is going to be well known. And, uh, you know, and that was the year it was the most difficult Jesus' generation conference. Like the weather was terrible, it rained like crazy, so the attendance was low, everyone got sick, people got tired, and this one lady I'll never forget in my entire life, maybe I, I still need healing from her, um, 
She was, she was just a visitor. And she scolded me for not having enough toilet paper in the woman's bathroom. I was like, lady, can you be like a little bit nice? Nicer? Oh, how could you not have toilet paper? Well, couldn't you have asked for a square from next stall? You probably didn't get it because you're so mean. <laughs> After that year, I, we made sure, hey, you got, we got the toilet paper in the ladies' room. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of people got sick. They got tired. And I was so tired. And, you know, uh, afterwards, resting at home a couple of days, this random voice came to me. You are burnt out. You should stop doing this because everyone is going to burn out. It's already happening. And it's going to come to everybody. You're burnt out. Everyone's going to burn out. Well, devil doesn't know me very well, does he? I have been around long enough to know that that voice was not the voice of the Lord. Because number one... In the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as being burnt out. Do you guys know that? When you burn for the Lord, either you burn stronger for the Lord, or you get cold and you freeze out. But you never burn out. Have you seen somebody on fire for God ever burn out? No, they freeze out. Nobody burns and burns and burns and they, oh, I feel so burnt. Why is God putting the Holy Spirit fire upon me? I'm so burnt out. I've never heard that. Right? You know, you guys know who Reinhard Bonnke is, right? Man, probably one of the greatest evangelists of our time. He was in Africa for 51 years serving the Lord. First two years, he went to South Africa to put up a tent. He said he didn't have a single convert for two years. He only had this one guy who came to him every day to argue with him why God is not real. His story is hilarious. Actually, that guy, after two years, becomes his first convert. Can you imagine putting up a tent, preaching Jesus, nobody, and there's this one guy just arguing with you the whole time. If anything, he should have experienced burn, burning out right there. But he didn't burn out. Never. For 51 years, he never burnt out. And at the end of his life, he passed away in 2019. 2018, he put a Facebook post that said this. God is the creator and produces only originals. His mind is too fruitful to make copies. The baptism into the Holy Spirit and fire lasts forever. If that is so, we will never need a new anointing. When David saw Goliath, he didn't run to Samuel to ask for a new anointing. No fresh fire was needed because there is not something like a stale fire. The presence of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Spirit and power are permanent. We may not always feel the power, but it is always there. We appropriate it by trust and faith. The bush of Moses burned. It was not consumed. God doesn't want us to become ash heaps. There are no burnouts with Jesus. Well, I don't agree 100% with what he says. Because I do believe in the fresh fire and the fresh new anointing. Uh, but maybe, you know, different terminology, but same concept. But one thing for sure that I agree with is the fire is always there. The Holy Spirit is there. Once we're baptized, it's there. We don't burn out. We freeze out because we do not allow that fire to come out and manifest in our lives. It's usually... We go through this when we are tired, discouraged, offended. Then the devil comes to speak to us. You're burnt out. 
Oh, you're right. I'm so tired. I'm going to quit. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to quit the worship team. They treat me like a slave. <laughs> Moving all the equipment for five years is enough. I can't handle it anymore. I'm not going to do the house of prayer anymore. Nobody's there. Nobody's there to hear my beautiful singing. I don't want to serve in the children and the youth anymore. Those brats. They don't appreciate me. All these thoughts come. And then you start feeling burnout and you just want to quit. And guess what? That's exactly when the devil comes. Is When you're about to go over a, a major hump. Major breakthrough, he wants you to quit. And you say, I'm burnt out, I'm going to quit. Well, if you feel tired, rest a little bit. But don't quit. Don't give this reason I'm burnt out because there's no such thing. Maybe you're not doing well in your relationship with God. Maybe you are having some issues at home. Usually... When I hear someone say, I'm, I'm burnt out, it has nothing to do really with ministry but what they're experiencing personally at home. Usually. Because think about this. No matter what you do in life, because we wear this thing called the physical body, we get tired. You know, one time I was so tired, I slept for 10 hours. And when I got up, I was so tired. <laughs> Have you guys ever been there before? One time I was so tired, I'm like, I need a vacation. I went on vacation, came back with both nosebleeds because I was so tired. Physically, we get tired. We are meant to get tired. But spiritually... It's not the same. Just because we are tired physically, it doesn't mean we are tired spiritually. But the devil wants us to be confused about those two things and equate physical tiredness with spiritual tiredness and make us think that we are burnt out. No, we're not. Repeat after me. All right, we need some deliverance prayer back there. <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> He's like, I'm tired of you, Pastor Ryan. <laughs> Repeat after me. There is no such words as burnt out in my dictionary. Never, ever. You may freeze out. When you feel that burnt out or being tired spiritually, it means your relationship with God needs some kind of a boost. It has nothing to do with whether you're serving the Lord. See, what happens is when we are not living in intimacy with God, labor of love that we do out of joy for the Lord becomes performance or work. And that's what makes us tired. You guys understand? See, being burnt out is not a physical state. It's a mental state. And it's something that the devil loves to lie to us. I mean, it's, it's something that we have to understand. That as we serve the Lord, as we have callings from the Lord, we need to make sure we don't buy into the deception from the devil and quit. Quitting is the very thing that the devil wants. I've seen it too often in 20 years of just serving this church. People on the verge of breakthroughs just quit. Oh, I can't take this anymore. And then comes like, oh, God told me this. God told me that. And that's why some of my friends have this thing called, you could use God told me only once a year. <laughs> Unless other people confirm it, you know. I used to have a, uh, I was a youth pastor. I used to have a youth teacher who started serving in our uh, youth group for two months. And she came to talk to me. She said, Pastor Ryan, I'm burnt out. I'm like, you just came two months?
months ago. Why are you burnt out? Oh, kids hate me and this and that. This is so difficult. And I'm like, because you signed up to be a teacher and you come to the, the Bible study 30 minutes late every week. No wonder kids don't respect you. You're not burnt out. You're already frozen. Yeah, start burning for the first time. I almost wanted to say that, but being the nice guy that I am, I felt bad for her. I prayed for her. So many times I see people walking away from what they're about to receive, the biggest breakthroughs, because it's so hard. Feel burnt out, feel like quitting, giving up. Well, those are the defining moments. You know, Elijah has this great encounter upon the mountains where the fire of God comes down. It slaughters the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth. Great victory for the Lord. And Ahab ran down the mountain on his horse and it says Elijah ran so fast he got there before. Some 20 miles. He would have been an Olympic gold medalist. And in that moment, Jezebel comes to him and says, I'm going to kill you, man. Yo, bro, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah says, like, oh, no. Here's this great man of God who just slaughtered 850 false prophets. And this one woman's like, I'm going to kill you. Oh, no, I'm going to run for my life. And he runs away. Depressed. God, don't you know what I have done for you? <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? See, in these moments, the lies come. Even great men and women go through it. But you need to overcome these lies. Because even greater anointing awaits you when you overcome it. Amen? And that's what I kind of uh, I, I want to look at today. I'll try to be brief because I want to be praying for this. Because I believe everyone here, God has given you a calling. And you need to rise up in this moment and not quit, give up, be burnt out. If you need rest, you can rest. But don't give up. And always examine your relationship with God. You know, when I was serving as a youth pastor, I just want to give you an example. When, I was, when Joanna and I first got married and we, uh, I was serving as a youth pastor, I used to have my own law practice. And at the same time, I was attending seminary. And I had started a mission group for China. And going to China every year. And I was captain of Awana for 200-something kids. I told my kids, at all costs, you need to win. I mean, you know, <laughs> not at all costs, but for the glory of God. And so people always ask me, how do you do all those things at once? Are you just multi-talent? You know, I'm just going to say a bunch of things that are on my mind. You're good at multitasking. No, I can only do one thing. All, I'm a morning person. I'm a night person. Don't ever limit yourself by labeling yourself. I'm a night person. I'm a morning person. I asked this one prophet one time because we're doing morning prayer all the time. And I asked her, or not, I didn't ask her, Pastor Daniel, who used to be at our church, asked her, are you a morning person? You know, Pastor Daniel is very careful, right? Like, uh, excuse me, like, are you a morning person? Because you love doing these um, morning prayer. And she got angry. She goes, I'm neither a morning person or a night person. That's what she said. I'll be a night person when God wants me to be a night person. I'll be a morning person when he tells me to be a morning person. I'll do whatever God wants me to do. We never want to label ourselves. 
I'm this, I'm that, I can't do this. No, we can do all things at all times when God tells us to do it. When God tells us to do something, guess what? He will give us the grace to do it. It's not because I was multi, you know, task, I was good at multitask or good at this or that. I just kept doing what God told me to do. They didn't have an Awana captain because some guy, like some seven-year-old guy, you know, did something and one of the high school teachers punched him. And the little kid's mom happens to be an unbeliever. And she wanted to sue the church. So the Awana captain, who was a deacon, resigned. So they were looking for a new Awana captain with this potential of the church being sued. So I said, well, if nobody can do it, I'll just do it. You know, these kids need And then I remember, like, the first day, the seven-year-old kid was a little brat. I'm, especially, well, now maybe seven-year-olds are more precocious and, you know, uh, more bratty. <laughs> I don't know. But back then, seven-year-olds weren't usually like that. But this guy used the F word to the teachers. And, and, and so one of the teachers came to me and said, I can't get that guy to stand on the line. He said, F that. F you. I'm going to just sit wherever I want. So where is he? <laughs> I dragged him by the neck. I threw him against the wall. And I told him to get out. And then he ran outside. And I told my teachers to go find him. <laughs> and then, uh, I, so he, he came with the teachers and I said, hey, listen, what do you think your mom's going to say if I told her everything that you did? You effed out, cussed out everybody. You did all these things. And he started getting worried because his mom's scary. I mean, I, I was scared of his mom. So, but I'm good at child psychology, you know. So he's like, he's just looking down, all scared. I said, listen, just for you, just for you, I will not tell her anything about tonight. Nothing that you did, nothing that I did, I won't tell her anything. We'll, we'll keep it our little secret. And he's all crying, he's like, thank you, thank you. He went back in, never gave trouble again. <laughs> Man, that was one of the greatest victories. I love, <laughs> I love to tell this story. To this day, nobody knows <laughs> except you guys. So why did I do all those things? It's because the Lord just told me to do it. And when, he, when you obey what God tells you to do, he will give you the grace for it. You're not supposed to burn out. Burnout is a lie. And some people live in fear of burning out. You know why that happens? Like, especially in our church, I see it sometimes because they were so offended at previous churches. <laughs> offended at the pastor, offended at something, this and that. That they oh, I don't want to burn out. I just want to make sure I pace myself and this and that. And I just want to tell you that these hurdles come where a devil will try everything in his might to make you quit. And that's when you know you are about to receive a great breakthrough. Amen. Amen? Amen? When I say this a lot, when farmers 
put scarecrows, do they put the scarecrows where the weeds are? No. Where do they put the scarecrow? Where the grain is, where the good stuff is. The devil doesn't try to scare you when there's nothing but weeds. He is trying to scare you because there's something good that is coming and he doesn't want you to have it. You guys understand what I'm saying, right? So now today we're going to just get over all the fears, all the uh, burnout, all these lies, deceptions, and you're going to break through. You're going to go through whatever you need to go through to receive from the Lord. Amen? Okay, 2 Kings chapter 2. That was the introduction, David. And people are going, oh my God. <laughs> if that was the introduction, don't worry. My body is not as long as the introduction. <laughs> Whenever a pastor says, in conclusion, it means nothing. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I'll say it now. In conclusion. No. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. We'll read it quickly. And it came about when the Lord was about to take up Elijah by a whirlwind to heaven, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, yes, I know, be still, meaning be quiet. Elijah said to him, Elijah, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elijah, said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered, yes, I know, be still. Then Elijah said to him, Please stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Now 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood opposite them at a distance. While the two of them stood by the Jordan, Elijah took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters. And they were divided here and there so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He said, you have asked for a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw Elijah no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and returned and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, struck the waters and said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the waters, they were divided here and there. And Elijah crossed over. Amen. Very simple story. God called Elisha to take over the ministry that Elijah was doing. And so Elijah goes and finds Elisha and says, Hey, you know, the Lord is telling me that you're going to be taking over my ministry. Come with me. And basically Elisha comes. And then uh, Elisha goes through this testing period. Goes to Gilgal. Eliza says, just stay here. No, 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 no. I'm going to follow you no matter what. Goes to Bethel. Stay here. And then all the other prophets are like, oh, you know that Eliza is going to be taken. Eliza is going to be taken. Why are you following him? Just, and he's like, be quiet. And he still follows him. Jericho and all the way to Jordan, he follows him. And finally, Eliza is taken. He was asking for double portions meaning that he wanted to be the successor. Double portion was always given to the first son as an inheritance. He wanted to be the successor of this ministry. And actually in the book, in the Bible, it's so interesting because Elijah ends up performing eight miracles, Elijah 16. 
So God is saying the double portions anointing came upon Elisha. You know, um, in Romans eleven twenty nine, this is what it says: For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And it was referring to Israel. Israel was living in disobedience to the Lord, but regardless of their disobedience, the gifts and the calling are not revocable. And that is a truth that is upon everybody. Whether you're living in obedience or disobedience, God's gifts and His calling are not revocable. Amen? He doesn't just take it away, no matter what. God won't change His mind about what you are called to do. If God has called you, that calling is still there, whether or not you have obeyed. We need to understand uh, this is the part that I'm getting at today. We need to understand the difference between gifts or gifting, calling, and the anointing. You guys know the difference? Gifting, calling, and anointing. It says here that the gifts and the calling are irrevocable. Right? What are the gifts? Gifts are the ability that God gives you to do something, right? You have all these gifts listed in 1 Corinthians all over, right? From gift of faith to gift of speaking in tongues, discerning the spirit, miracles, and all this stuff. Gifts give you the ability to do the work that you are called to do, right? And I remember Chris Volatin uh, preaching that sometimes people... Use the giftings to define their identity. No, callings define our identity, not the giftings. Just because you have a gift of prophecy doesn't mean you're a prophet. If you're called to be a prophet, you cannot be a prophet if you walk into that calling. You guys understand? Just because I have a gift uh, of prophecy, that doesn't make me a prophet. So actually, so many people use the gifts to define and identify their calling. But you can't do that. You need to hear from the Lord what your calling is. You guys understand this? I have seen many intercessors call themselves a prophet. But in my opinion, their calling was an intercessor. An intercessor is good enough. If that's what God has called you to be, then it's good. But, you see, in the minds of the people, they, they want to be a prophet, not an intercessor. But you know what I think? I think a lot of intercessors are going to have great rewards in heaven. Because they didn't receive it here and they didn't even see it sometimes. You know, even as I preach sometimes, uh, randomly I say some things and then uh, I don't even know why I said it. And I would get an email later or find out many years later that what I said, uh, uh, you know, the Lord used it. I'm just wondering, like, for all those years, I, I would be like, why did I even say that? So random, all of a sudden, in the middle of, you know, preaching. But then I find out later. I be, and when I find out, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe God used that to touch people. But just imagine intercessors. You'll never know a lot of the stuff that you're praying for. Whether they're coming to pass or whether this is touching people, moving nations. But the Lord uses them powerfully. Amen? Amen. But then, in our mind, we think intercessors is lower than a prophet. In the kingdom of God, nobody is greater. The greatest one is who serves the least and serves the most, the Lord. Amen? 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 Prophets, apostles, don't try to become somebody based on your giftings. You just have to walk out what you're called to do. All these titles don't mean much at all, especially if you're in the wrong business. I have seen so many people who are trying to become pastors, and they're not called to be pastors. On the other hand, I've seen so many people who are called to be pastors, and they don't want to step in because they understand the risk. Giftings and callings. Those, I mean, that's pretty clear, right? But 
what I'm here to tell you is that we could operate out of our gifts, and it may touch people, it may draw a crowd, but when we operate out of the anointing, it brings breakthroughs. And that's what I'm going to go over today, because what is an anointing? Well, simply put, anointing uh, is putting oil on somebody, right? Separation. God anointed the priests, prophets, the kings. It's for a certain job, certain office, or a certain job. God separates this person by putting an anointing. And when we look at the New Testament, the anointing simply means like rubbing of oil, right? This crushed oil that comes up on people. Jesus was anointed to do what? To preach the good news, to set the captives free, to heal the sick, and so on and so on, right? Isaiah 61. He had the anointing. And then so in Acts 10.38, when they go back and look at Jesus, uh, and they're testifying about Jesus, they say, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. Meaning, for the thing that he was called to do, God put the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which means empowerment. Empowerment. I mean, it is so interesting because Jesus Christ or the Messiah, what does Messiah mean? The anointed one. Christ means the anointed one. So he is the anointed one. He is the one with empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So... In the charismatic circle, this word is thrown out a lot. You know, oh, he's so anointed. He's so gifted. He's so anointed. Oh, man, the anointing. There was this famous pastor, and whenever he did a conference, all the room would just go dark all of a sudden. And then the TV will turn on or the screen, and this crazy music will play. Like, like this, you know, it like shakes everybody and it goes, now you're about to experience the anointing of Reverend Archbishop, Pastor, Apostle, so and so. Like, how many titles does he have? Professor, PhD. With the permanent head damage. There you go. So what is the anointing? Why, how come some people have the anointing and some people don't? And how you get it and so on and so on. And this is what I believe. And people could have different opinions, but this is what I believe. I believe everyone is anointed. To a certain degree. For their calling. Whatever they're supposed to do. So everyone's anointed. Because why? Who lives inside of us? The anointed one. The anointed one lives inside of us. So we have certain degree of anointing. Everybody. But then that anointing. When it gets developed and increases. And it manifests the anointed one and his power, that's when people recognize the anointing on that person. Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen. It's not like something special. Well, it could be, uh, terminology can be used in, in various ways. But I believe the main way to say it is that the anointed one that lives inside of us comes out. Because of what we have gone through and how we have allowed the anointing to increase. And in the Bible it says it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. Right? Can you put that verse up there? From Isaiah. And so all of us want the anointing. We want the anointing. It says... It shall come to pass that day that his burden shall be taken away from off his shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. King James Version. So if we want to serve God, 
we don't want to just operate out of gifts. We want the anointing. We have the giftings, but we want to go further and receive the anointing or increase uh, the anointing that we have. Because the anointing that we have is going to bring breakthroughs wherever we minister. Amen. Amen. So, how do we get there? How do we get anointed? I mean, we are already anointed, but how do we increase in our anointing? And I believe that's what Elijah shows here. Is there an ice cream truck outside? I think there's an ice cream truck. I'll take two. Chocolate bar. When Elijah is allowing Elijah to follow him and wants, to, wants him to succeed him, he tests him. The first place they go is this place called Gilgal. And you guys know Gilgal is where the circumcision happened. Gilgal means, means to roll away, to separate. So the first place for the anointing that we have to go to is separation from the world, separation from the world, separated unto God. That testing will always come for people who want to increase their anointing. Like I know many gifted people out there doing, living their same old life and their gifts are being used, but they don't have the anointing to break the yoke. Why? Because they're still living their life. They still have open doors. It's the same old life. They can't separate themselves. So there will be always a testing of whether we are willing to separate ourselves from the old and come into the new that God is calling us. Elijah said, just stay here in Gilgal. And he said, no, I'm, I'm going to follow you. Jesus will test us. Half one foot in, one foot out. Do you want to live comfortably? I feel like this is a test that a lot of people go through these days. Man, the millennials and Gen Zs are so smart these days because everything's in go uh, on Google. They know parenting better than uh, parenting that I was taught or even better than our my parents. But when I look at the style of parenting in this new young generation, I worry about what's coming. I'm being honest. My generation parenting was simple. We just take our kids to church until midnight. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? I didn't have to worry about things like, oh, what if there are germs and this and that? Oh, their sleep schedule this and sleep schedule that. My kids slept at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock eating McDonald's sometimes. And look at my son. He's so beautiful. Takes after his daddy. <laughs> no, seriously, like Pastor Joseph's kids, same thing. Like they slept in the back of the sanctuary. We had we used to have like summer, like eight weeks straight of Friday night overnight prayer, and uh, the, the little kids will just sleep in the back with sleeping bags and stuff. I'm serious. I, I'm worried because. What seems so good in the eyes of the world, is that really God? We don't want to separate sometimes the things of the world from things of God. And we have it so mixed up together. Because nowadays, what matters the most to a lot of people is my comfort. This is so... Prevalent even in the church. My comfort. My comfort level. 
Well, there's someone that I should forgive and love, but uh, you know what? I'm not comfortable. That person did me wrong. Then the separation doesn't happen. You can't grow in the anointing. You forgive no matter what, what they have done. Go and forgive that person. I've had so many people come up to me and say, I forgive you, Pastor Ryan. I go, for what? And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I forgive you. No. For telling me that you forgive me. But you got to let these things go, all the old things go. Let the things of the world, their methodology go and seek God and separate yourselves and your family unto God. Do what God wants you to do. You understand? Then you'll grow in the anointing. We have so many worship leaders and musicians and I have been all around the world looking at some musicians and, you know, there are many gifted musicians not that many anointed musicians. There are a lot of preachers, but there are not that many anointed preachers. What's the difference between like some young kid preaching about love versus Heidi Baker preaching about love? Why? She's living it out. She's separated herself. She's given up everything, including her life. Separated herself unto the Lord. And there's the anointing. Right? If you want to serve God with the anointing to break the yoke for people that we love all around us in our family, we got to get to that place. Separation, number one. Number two, what's the second place that they go to? Bethel, house of God. It's talking about the fellowship and union with God. It's about the presence. Being in his presence. Becoming one with God. If we can't be one with God, if we don't chase after his presence, the anointed one cannot come out. My flesh will come out. My gifts may come out, but the anointing cannot grow. Third one quickly is Jericho. Jericho is a place where everybody walked around in obedience 13 times. Everyone be quiet. Shh. But my legs are tired. Shh. Why do we have to? Shh. They're looking at Be quiet. Just walk it out by faith. Whatever God is giving you, what is he is telling you in his presence, start walking it out by faith. This is where a lot of people also fail. It's like the, the woman in Song of Solomon. The presence of God, the house of God is so beautiful, so lovely. When Jesus says, come outside, she's like, no, I like my comfort place. But we need to walk it out. In Korea, <clears throat> uh, the first time I went, all these people lined up to pray, and then I looked at this one person, and I was praying for him. And God said, I called him to be a pastor. And whenever I get a word like that, I'm almost never wrong, especially about the pastoral calling. I said, God called you to be a pastor. What are you doing right now? He said he's at a church uh, that he's been serving since he was youth. But that church doesn't believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came, came to me and said, see, a lot of people like to justify their place of comfort. You guys, you guys know this? It seems like a righteous reason why you should stay there, but it is wrapped up in actually disobedience and wanting to be just comfortable. So he tells me, well, I'm in this church. I'm praying that one day, you know, the pastor and they will experience the Holy Spirit, this. And then I'm like, no, that's not your calling. God can do that, but that's not your calling. 
You just don't want to come out of there, out of the place of your comfort. But I, I will tell you, I, mean, I was like, I was like, who is this? I don't normally speak to people like that. Or do I? <laughs> I was like, if you never come out of that church, you're never going to walk into your calling. You need to walk it out by faith. Come out. Come to this church, which was toll ministry. And you better be trained here. And he just had this serious look. I knew he was a genuine person. I was like, man, I normally don't tell people to move churches or go whatever, but Holy Spirit was so strong on me if you don't come out of there. Because, you know, he wants to do the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How can you be under a covering that doesn't even believe in the Spirit, right? So I was very strong, and I, I said that. And uh, about three months later, I went back to Korea. And he, he comes running to me at the, at the meeting and says, Pastor Ryan, I have made a decision. My, I have decided to leave my church. My pastor was very sad because I've been there for like 20 years. But then I made the transition to this church. And I said, good for you. You're walking out what God is giving you by faith. Yes. This past trip in July, we were in Japan. And uh, one of the pastors who happened to be there was that guy who's now become a pastor. He's traveled to like four or five nations already <laughs> preaching the gospel. And I said, so how do you feel? And every time he sees me, he's so thankful. Because nobody would dare say things like that, right? But my mentality is like, well, Korea, they could hate me. I don't have to go back there. <laughs> I live in America. They could all hate me back there. It's like, don't come. Yeah, well, I don't have to go there, you know. So I just speak whatever, like <laughs> whatever the Holy Spirit gives me. Repent. You know, do whatever. And, and he said he is so thankful that he's so happy that he's able to walk out his calling. And he's preaching the gospel. He's been to Sri Lanka, Saudi Arabia, now Japan. A lot of people get stuck right here, Jericho. This testing, because they don't want to come out of their comfort zone. I want the best of everything, but I don't want to pay the price. Well, everything has a price to be paid, especially the anointing. Anointing, giftings are given by God, and yeah, you need to spend time to develop it, but anointing can only be obtained by paying a price. That's what I believe. Anointing doesn't just some, you know, come up on somebody all of a sudden. No. Anointing, the, the, the oil that is used to anoint people back in the old days, they were all crushed. You know why some of you have gone through crushing in your life? Whether it's through your family, whether it's through a sudden death, or sudden uh, illness, or sudden financial crisis. Do you know why you have been going through this crushing? Because the Lord wants to increase that anointing to use you to break off the yoke on all these other people that are suffering who are waiting for you. Amen. And they are waiting for you. But you can't just be like, oh, but I want to be in this comfort zone. I want to be in Jericho. I want to be in Gilgal. I want to do this. I want to raise up my kids in this way. I don't want to be burnt out and freeze out or whatever. And living in fear, living according to human logic and psychology, that's not going to get you the anointing. Sure. You got to walk it out. And the fourth test is crossing the Jordan, which is the hardest. Jordan refers to death. <laughs> Baptism, right? That's where Jesus got baptized. It's talking about the death and resurrection. It's a process. As you're walking out, you're calling. 
situations will arise where you feel like you're going to die. You feel like you're burnt out or frozen out. And that's what I'm talking about. You can't quit there and you can't live in fear of that. You got to go through it. Even if I die, I die. You got to have this Esther mindset. You know what? If God's going to kill me, well, that's his loss. I have, I have that kind of uh, mentality. You got to go through it. And when you're going through it, do you know anything? Like today I was uh, listening to, I have been listening to this one song from Korea. From this uh, group, and I even uploaded it to our Korean group because it's a Korean song. There's a group called Levistans in Korea. And uh, anyway, there's a song that this girl sings that is so anointed. Like the anointing, I feel it. Like I feel life coming from that anointing. And so I know my family gets annoyed, but I put it on repeat and listen to it a hundred times a day. That's just who I am. That's why they all have earphones, you know. But I'm like, this is so good, honey. Why is she so anointed? And she was telling me, you know, my wife knows everything. She, she's telling me, you know that girl? She comes from a non-believing family. And her parents, like, went all in with her, wanted her to become this world-famous singer. They sent her to Berkeley in Boston, Berkeley School of Music, which is number one, you know. They paid for all that, and then she came back, and she decided to become a full-time worship leader or worshiper at this church. Yeah, even when that church was small, a small house of prayer. It reminded me of like Sarah, <laughs> you know, even from the beginning. And she just served there faithfully. And now that church has become big. To this day, some 10 years later, do you know that her mom has a picket outside the church? Calling this church a cult. She has gone through that kind of persecution from her own family. I mean, you know how hard that is to, <laughs> can you imagine? Like you go outside your mom's like, <laughs> Pastor Ryan is evil. <laughs> Blessed is evil. Oh, please come save my daughter. How embarrassing that is, how crazy that is. And she's gone through that and she said yes to the Lord. That's, that's like the death and resurrection right there. If you can't die to yourself, you can't do it. But when you die to yourself, you gain the resurrection power. You guys understand? And that's Jordan. That's the final test. When they cross the Jordan... Unless he receives the anointing or the power, he can't come back. He's going to drown in the middle of the sea. But he walked there by faith. He risked his own life. And he got the anointing, the power, empowerment of God. And that empowerment of God, the great increase comes when you go through those moments where you feel like you're going to die. Oh my gosh, I can't take this anymore, God. Why are you doing this to me? Have you had those moments? <laughs> Why can't you just simply just take all these demons away? Why can't you just give me a million dollars? Right? <laughs> I can't take it, God. Month after month, week after week, you know, <laughs> our ministry... Now is in a lot better situation, but I used to tell my wife, we're like, oh, we're month to month. 
And I thought I would get some kind of, uh, you know, pity from my wife. And, and she goes, you know, Mike Pickle says they are week to week. I'm like, oh. You know, I help, right, Kansas City? I'm like, okay, we're better than week to week or month to month. But all these death-like moments where you feel like dying is because God wants to kill your flesh. God wants to kill off the things that will hinder the anointing. Oh, but I can't give this one up. This is so important to me. And usually that's what God asks. All right? That's why like some pastors like try to use river psychology on God. God, I never, never want a private jet. Please. Please don't give me a billion dollars, God. Anything but that. <laughs> You know, Apostle Paul, uh, he wrote so many books in the Bible, right? So many letters that he wrote. And it, it is my opinion, I don't think he ever thought that it will become Bible. I think he was just inspired by the Holy Spirit, he wrote it. I think if we were to go to heaven and ask him, I think he will be so humbled by the fact that God used him like that. To touch billions of people. Right? You know, when you read through First and Second Corinthians, all the stuff that he goes through is like how many times he was beaten, how many times he almost drowned, how many times he got robbed. All the trials and testings that he goes through. Moments where he thought he was going to die. And each time, I believe what ends up happening is, in those moments, he becomes so desperate only for God that his flesh dies even more and more. He gains the resurrection of power from God. So at the end of his life, he writes this letter to the Philippian church, Philippians 3, 7 through 11, that summarizes what I just went over with you. Philippians 3. 7 through 11. Philippians 3, 7 through 11, right? Okay, we're going one verse at a time. But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus for whom I have suffered loss of all things, and count them mere rubbish so that I may gain Christ. This is talking about Gilgal, separation, losing everything, leaving everything behind for Jesus, right? Okay, next verse. And may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Here is talking about the union being found in him, and having his righteousness, becoming one with him, and then uh, he's uh, walking that out through faith. Believing it through faith, he received it, right? That's what we talked about in terms of Bethel and Jericho, right? And then he says, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's talking about Jordan. He's gone through it so much and he's gained so much from his experience. I mean, I don't know that many people who says, I want the sufferings. But he says, you know what? I want the fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be conformed to his death. Because I know behind it comes the resurrection power. Apostle Paul was not just gifted, he was anointed. His anointing was so powerful. Everywhere he went, 
the gospel was preached. People were saved. Demons left. People were healed. Yokes were broken because he paid this price where it was no longer him when he ministered, but the anointed one would come out and minister to the people. And that's what I want for all of us when we go to different places to minister. We don't want people saying, oh man, Pastor Ryan, he's so handsome and gifted. <laughs> Though it may be true. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear, oh my gosh, the anointing and the presence of God was so powerful. People's lives were transformed. That's what I want to hear. I love the fact that we go in mission teams in groups of six or seven and we pray for people. We don't know who God used to heal who. But people get healed and delivered and saved. I love that. Why? Because Jesus manifested. The anointed one manifested. The Holy Spirit came. You know why people... Don't like the Holy Spirit. Oh, they say they like the Holy Spirit, but they don't. Is the Holy Spirit, if you read through the book of John, who does he point people to and lead them to? Jesus. And Jesus leads people to who? The Father. So the devil is at work fighting the gifts of the Holy Spirit, ministry of the Holy Spirit, because they don't want people to find out about Jesus. They don't want people to find out about the love of the Father. But you and I are different. We're not going to go for that kind of lies and deceptions. I want the anointing to come alive in people. The anointed want to come out. You have problems in your family? You have problems with your finances. When the anointed one comes. I've seen so many families get healed. Because they went through this process of dying. Dying to self. Allowing the, the anointed one to manifest. I've seen so many anointed worship. You know, I love my wife. And I'll end on this note so we'll have good dinner. She was a gifted musician. <laughs> but she was a really gifted musician. And she was doing her master's at USC. And then she met me. <laughs> so she had to give that career up to follow me. To follow Jesus, right? <laughs> But in the process, not because of me, but I have seen God go through this process of anointing with her, increasing her anointing. She went through Gilgal. When we started our ministry, she used to have five best friends. She lost them all just overnight because of some things that we did out of obedience. And her friends were like, what, you think you, you are better than us? Because we just were hearing the voice of God and doing things. She lost her, all of her friends, separated herself. That separation happened. And then she fell in love with Jesus, house of Bethel. All she wanted to do was she wanted to move to Kansas City. And I'm like, you're going by yourself. I'm not moving to Kansas City when like 1 through 10 is going to park the best things to do in Kansas City. <laughs> That's not for me. Oh, barbecue is like number eight. <laughs> and then I saw her start walking out her faith, Jericho, going to different nations, going to different warfare places, and then now doing... Night watches. <laughs> night watches. I mean, Thursday and Friday night, she's like there all night. And I'm, I'm like, how are you surviving? I 
And she started just doing that out of obedience to the Lord. And through that, she probably has gone through the death process many times. Many times God has even used me for that. <laughs> She's anointed because of me. <laughs> <laughs> because of all the persecution I gave her. I'm like, take it easy, honey. You can't do this all the time. Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, Jordan. And she went through a lot of warfare naturally because that's the thing that, you know, God wanted to bring out the anointing. And I remember one time she was telling me, Ryan, I think... Maybe I should stop worshiping. I'm like, why? She's like, I feel like now we have enough people who can do this and that. And she just gave me a bunch of reasons. And I said, the day that you quit worshiping, I'm going to quit preaching. <laughs> and she's like, what? I said, I need your worship. Because the anointing is there. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. I mean, people who know, know. People who don't, especially if you're jealous of her, then you don't know. And immediately, I think it was, uh, which prophet was it? I mean, was it James Gall or Pastor Jenny? Immediately within a month, one of these prophets come, looks at her and says, the devil is trying to make you quit worshiping because he hates your voice. I'm like, I told you. Some people will just listen to me. You don't need prophetic words. <laughs> it's so funny because like I would say give the same advice. And then some prophet comes, says the same thing in a more holy way. Oh, thus says the Lord, God Almighty. I am who I am. Says this. And then it's the same thing I've been saying. You don't need all these prophetic words. If you would just listen to your pastors. And then they come, oh my God, Pastor Ryan, I got the greatest word ever. I've been telling you that for five years. <laughs> anyway, a lot of time has gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> Today was a little bit longer than usual. But uh, I really wanted everyone to grasp this. Don't be jealous of anybody. Don't be jealous of the anointing. Anointing is something that you cannot steal from someone or take somebody else's it's something that you have to go through to Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho why is Sarah so anointed when she worships man she went through a lot of battles of her own and she remained faithful to the Lord for 20 years how can anointing not come I love when Sarah worships because the anointing is there I love when Joanne worships. And even though my voice is not the best, I love it when I worship. <laughs> All by myself in my car, in home. My family members may have their earphones on, but I know the anointing is there when I worship. Because <laughs> I have gone through some stuff myself. All that to say, you guys, Go through it. Don't quit. Go for it. Get the anointing. Don't just be a gifted this and that, but go for the anointing. People are waiting for you. Don't quit. Don't give up. Especially when it's hard, when it gets difficult. That's when the anointing is about to increase into double portions.